When Ricardo was 10, he had an accident while jumping over a fence. He didn't notice the thin metal wire on the other side of the fence and it caused him to hit the ground head first. After the accident, he began to lose his sight. At school, he had trouble seeing what the teacher wrote on the chalkboard, so he asked to sit in the front row. After a while, he couldn't even see from there. Finally, the teacher sent him home, saying the school could not teach a blind boy. Ricardo's parents took him to many doctors, but none could help him. They said he would never see again. Ricardo was very sad. He could no longer play soccer, ride a bicycle, or play hide-and-seek with his friends. When he went outside, he could hear his old playmates making fun of him. The boys and girls thought that their jokes were harmless. They didn't know that their words were hurting Ricardo. He felt hopeless. One day, an older cousin invited Ricardo to go to a Pathfinder outing. The cousin was the leader of a Pathfinder club. Ricardo didn't want to go, but his cousin kept insisting, so he finally went. He was surprised that he could participate in many of the Pathfinder activities. His cousin even asked him to help out. Ricardo felt needed. He felt good. A short time later, Ricardo heard a sermon that made him want to give his heart to Jesus. But then trouble struck. At the baptismal class, the teacher asked Ricardo and the others who wanted to be baptized to memorize the Ten Commandments. But Ricardo couldn't read the Bible or the piece of paper with the Ten Commandments that the teacher passed out. He sadly thought that he would not be able to get baptized. At home, his mom encouraged him. God willing, you will get baptized, she said. During the week, his older sister read the Ten Commandments out loud to Ricardo. She read them again and again so he could memorize them. On Friday, everyone who wanted to be baptized gathered at the church. Who will be the first to recite the Ten Commandments? A church elder asked. No one else volunteered, so Ricardo raised his hand. He recited all ten perfectly. The elder was amazed and shook his hand. Turning to the others, he asked, who will recite like Ricardo? The next day on Sabbath, everyone was baptized, including Ricardo. Shortly afterward, he was invited to share the weekly mission story in Sabbath school. When some church members heard, they asked the Sabbath school leader to change his mind. Ricardo can't tell the mission story because he can't read they said. The Sabbath school leader gently touched Ricardo on the shoulder. Do you hear what they are saying? He asked. Ricardo nodded. Show everyone what you are able to do, he said. Prepare to tell the story next Sabbath. Ricardo's sister read the mission story to him from the mission quarterly, and he easily memorized it. On Sabbath, Ricardo told the story from beginning to end. When he finished, loud and astonished amens filled the church. Today, Ricardo is a 25-year-old university student and is preparing to become a pastor. He has led a Pathfinder club for the past two years, and he preaches regularly in churches around Angola. Dozens of people have been baptized after hearing his sermons. Your generous offering will help build a school in Ricardo's hometown of Luanda, Angola. Pray that the work of the school results in others like Ricardo who are eager to teach others about Jesus. Thank you for your support of Mission. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Yesterday, the world celebrated what we call Good Friday or the day that Jesus was crucified. Today, the Sabbath day, the day that he rested in the tomb and tomorrow is the great resurrection for us. The day where Jesus conquered death and he was resurrected to life and he now living in heaven is ministering to us here on earth as we await his soon return. So we're excited as we dive back into the book of Genesis to look at the study because last week 
we looked at the fall of humanity. And this week, Dr. Jacques Ducan actually makes a parallel between Genesis 3 and 4. And so we're going to dive into chapter 4 and take a look at the story of Cain and Abel. And just point out a couple highlights, a couple ideas that were expressed in this week's Sabbath School lesson. If you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, I invite you to read it. It's a rich lesson. There's so much there. We can't even unpack it all in this short amount of time together. But I trust and pray that as you open God's Word, and as you read through it for yourself this weekend and this coming week, that God will speak to your heart personally and powerfully. So with that said, let's dive into our study with a word of prayer. God, thank you so much that as we open up your Word, you can reveal who you are to us that you can reveal your story, history, and that, Lord, we can see ourselves, where our origin is, where we're headed, what you want us to do, where you're taking this world. And, Lord, I pray through the story of Cain and Abel that you will speak personally and powerfully to our own struggle. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, I invite you to look at the memory verse for this week, which says this, Genesis 4-7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. This is an important memory verse that we have because it speaks to our own struggles with temptation and with sin. When I was a kid and my mom would bake and I'd smell the beautiful aromas of cookies or cakes or whatever she was making, When I was a little kid, sometimes we attempted when no one was looking to go sneak into the kitchen where my room wasn't too far and I could try to get a cookie and rearrange the cookie so it looks like nothing was out of place. Little temptations for us can often turn to big temptations when we don't bring those things to God. Well, before we get into the story of Cain's temptation, let's take a look at Adam and Eve. Because it says when they gave birth to uh, to Cain, Adam and Eve had a picture in their mind of hope. Now, God gave hope to them in Genesis 3.15 when he talked about the serpent would bite the heel and that the seed would crush the head. And this, in essence, was the proto-evangelion, or the first intimation of the gospel message, that even in their sin, even in the consequences that they would experience, God put this idea that the seed, the seed, singular seed, would come at some point and defeat the evil one. Now, it's interesting when Eve explains that in Genesis 4.1, and let's put this up on the screen for you now, this slide of Genesis 4.1, where she says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and Eve said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. A more literal translation would actually be Eve saying, I have acquired a man, the Lord. And in that inference in Hebrew, it's just giving us an idea that in her mind, she was thinking that Cain could be possibly the fulfillment of God's promise in Genesis 3.15 of this singular seed that would come through that would defeat and crush Satan. Well, we know that the seed is not referring to Cain here. It's actually referring to Jesus down the line in their progeny over the generations. But look at what Ellen White said in this one quote, where she says this. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the Deliverer. Dukan actually points out that Cain's name is mentioned many times. Uh, People speak about him, and even he is given more chance to speak at times compared to Abel, which again alludes to the focus on Cain as he's the deliverer, the one who's going to come through and, and deliver us from evil and from Satan. But they were wrong, as they were before. They misapplied the prophecy. And that's a question I want to bring up for us that's not in the lesson. Are there times we rush to apply what we observe in the world or what we see in our lives to the prophetic statements that the Bible talks about, whether it's the book of Daniel or Revelation? Sometimes we're quick to take what we see in the headlines and try to fit it into a prophecy 
that's given to us. We got to be careful. And then studying prophecy, there's several guidelines we can look at at some point, but these are important things we need to consider before we rush to judgment about an event or something that's happening. We need to take the time to study it through, to observe, and to ask God for guidance, especially in a group of people. So as we move forward in our lesson, we're looking at Genesis 4, we see that Cain and Abel had different occupations. Cain was a tiller of the ground, and let's not forget that the ground was also cursed after Adam and Eve sinned. Even God said, by the sweat of their brow, you will yield the fruit from the ground. So here we have Cain toiling in the ground, raising up crops and vegetables. And we also now on the opposite side have Abel. He was a tender of the sheep. And these two professions required very different psychologies, different mentalities. For Cain, it required more physical exertion. Uh, he had to have an impetus to be able to, to be strong and, and to the motive to be able to cultivate and to bring forth of his own sweaty work the fruits of his labor. Abel, on the other hand, had to be patient with the flocks, watching them grow, uh, helping them mate, helping them uh, increase in number and making sure they're safe and, and providing more compassion, more care to them. It required them to be different in those moments and developing those different characters. Dukan points out that um, the worship actually is going to be different. Now, worship was given to all of them the same. You know, when we see Adam and Eve sinning and God meets out the consequences that they're each going to experience and that the ground will experience, that the world's going to experience, that their progeny is going to experience, God then provides them with animal skins as coverings. When they sinned and they discovered they were naked, that that spiritual covering was gone. They actually tried to sew fig leaves together to hide their nakedness. And that's when God asked, why are you hiding? What, where are you? You know, who told you you were naked? Well, in place of their own self-made clothing from leaves, God gave them animal skins. Where did he get those? An animal had to be sacrificed is the implication. And so we come now down to Cain and Abel offering to God what he had set up for them to offer. And the implication is that they were to offer an animal. Well, Abel's the one who tended the sheep. And him and Cain could easily have come together to offer the same sacrifice from the sheep. And also to bring a thank offering, as we see possibly in the vegetables and fruits. But all we have is a record of Abel being the one bringing this sacrificial lamb, and Cain did not. So, why, was, why did God only accept Cain's offering? Well, you we mentioned that possibly God could have given them instruction, as he provided Abney coverings. They didn't provide their own coverings, God provided the coverings for them. Abel didn't create the sheep, he just cared for it, guided it. He helped it along. So as we take a look here, of course, that these offerings are only symbolic. They're not real offerings in the sense that they would take away their sins. But it did point to the one that would take away our sins, and that's Jesus Christ. As we see in the statement from John the Baptist, going to the New Testament just for a moment, we see in John the Baptist him making a statement to two of his disciples, when he's pointing to Jesus as Jesus walking by, and he says these words in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now an application we can bring as a result of looking at the way they worship God and how one's was accepted and one's was not is asking the question, how can we bring Abel's attitude of obedience into our worship and into every part of our daily lives? Where am I falling short of God's call on my life as his child, as a professed follower of him? We can trust by faith that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete that work. We don't have the power to transform our lives. We don't have the power to make our hearts love God. We don't have the power to make our minds and our wills obey God 
what we can do is simply choose. We can choose to bring ourselves as we are to God and let God be the one to work out His will in us, to allow God to bring in His obedience in us, to bring His compassion in us. Every part that we need to live in a worshipful life to God. So now we come to the crime of Cain. And let's take a quick look here for a moment where we look at Cain's crime and the tragedy he brought upon his own family, his relationship to God. Let's take a look at and read Genesis 4, 3-8. through We're going to read straight through and then we'll make a few comments after that. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. Abel on his part also brought an offering from the firstborn of his flock and from their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his face was gloomy. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face gloomy? If you do well, will your face not be cheerful? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain talked to his brother Abel, and it happened that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. It's interesting that Professor Dukan points out that Cain was not just jealous of Abel's offering, but he was angry, angry, angry at God for not accepting his offering. So this is the twofold experience that Cain is having. He's upset at God because although he didn't follow God's instructions for, for bringing a sacrifice, he brought vegetables instead and did not and left out the, the lamb. He's upset at God for not accepting his offering when he himself disobeyed. And that's like you and I. When we purposefully and willfully disobey God, we often blame on God the things that are happening to us, the consequences we experience from our choices when we disobey Him. And that's what Cain was doing. We're not much different from Cain in that regard. It might be different, but here Cain is blaming God. Now what's interesting is that God asked him those two questions, and there are two questions that Cain is dealing with within himself. It's not that God doesn't know the answer, as Professor Dukan points out, God does know the answer. It's like when he asked Adam and Eve in the garden when after they sinned, where are you? And then he asked them, who told you you were naked? And it's very interesting that we see this about God where he does kind of investigation. Like in the, when the Tower of Babel is being built, it's, he says, hey, let's go down and look at what they're doing. Well, God can see clearly from his vantage point what they're doing. But this is a way of letting us know. It's a cue that says God is coming to investigate. Well, when God asks questions of Cain, he's asking Cain to take a look inside. He's asking Cain to be aware, self-aware of his motives, his intentions, what he's dealing with on the inside, his own psychology. Some people say it's not good to focus on yourself. Well, we're not saying focus at yourself at the expense of seeing God. What we're saying, God is saying is you need to take a look and be aware of what's going on inside of you. What impulses are moving you to act and behave in the way that you're acting and behaving? So here we have him um, asking him to take a look. And God's desire is actually to redeem Cain. He's actually wanting Cain to, to turn away from his anger, to turn away from his jealousy, to not continue in this path. Because if he does, painful things are going to happen as we read in the scriptures here. And that's God's desire for us. God desires for us to follow in His way. God wants to guide us. He wants to give us counsel so that you and I can experience what He says to Cain, cheerful, a, a cheerful disposition, a cheerful smile, a cheerful soul. Obedience out of love to God brings us true joy. Because we're not just doing it because like, I have to do it. No, God gave us everything. And he calls us to follow him because he knows where the spiritual landmines are. He knows how we can hurt ourselves if we go running through the field and not care what's out there. He desires to guide us in life because he wants us to be with him, not just during our time on earth, but forever. Ultimately, 
when God is telling him, hey, you got to be careful that sin that's crouching at your door, Cain. God is not saying that Cain has to do it on his own strength. We discover through the scriptures as we read God's story in our story that it's God's victory in us that makes it possible for us to have victory over temptation and over sin. God gives us that victory. I love this promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which reads like this. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. God was giving Cain every opportunity to turn away from his evil intentions of of acting out in his jealousy and acting out in his anger. And we know that he, he lured his brother into the field and then he struck him and killed him. This not only broke God's heart, but imagine the parents, Adam and Eve, losing both of their sons because Abel's dead and Cain ran away to live far away. What pain our sinful behaviors and choices have, not just on us, but on other people. But as we read the story of Cain, it's interesting, and Jacques Dukan shared this with us students at seminary. He said in our Hebrew class, When people stop talking to God, like Cain did, God was talking to Cain and Cain walked away. When we stop engaging with God, we open up ourselves to go our own way. If Cain just stayed in the conversation with God, even if he wrestled with God, God, it feels so unfair. God, I, I did all this work for you. God can continue talking with Cain. Cain could continue listening. Imagine what would happen at the end of that conversation what might, have the out, what might the outcome have been had Cain stuck in the conversation with God? I believe it would have been a different outcome. Let us not give up, friends, in prayer when we're struggling, being tempted with our anger, tempted with our jealousy, tempted with whatever emotion or feeling or intention is trying to move us to do something against God's will. Let us stop and pause and start talking to God and listening to God and see what he has for us. There's more to be said about this story, actually, and what happens with Cain and the descendants. There's a lot more in this lesson study. We just don't have time right now to finish it all, but I invite you to continue and finish this lesson study if you haven't already, and you can even start reading ahead for the study that's coming now. All those lessons are ahead, actually. They're all there online for you to look at and take a running, running study of it. But I love that God does not abandon us to our selfish inclinations, and he did not abandon uh, Cain, but he had to let him go to make his choices because God doesn't force our will. God gave us a will to choose, to follow him or follow ourselves. It is for us to respond to God so that we can experience the cheerfulness, the joy God wants us to have in the core of our hearts. I pray on this resurrection weekend that you will experience God speaking to your heart. What areas of your life do you need God to warn you about or lovingly speak to you about to bring some correction so that your life can get on track in following God in His footsteps? I invite you to pray that prayer. God, what does He want me to know about where I'm focused on myself, my feelings, my negativity, my self-centeredness? This is a prayer I want for myself as well because I want to overcome the sin that has so often overcome me in my life. And really comes down to choice. Am I going to choose to trust God to get me through? Or am I going to choose to trust in my own strength and my own intelligence to get me through? The choice is, is clear, but it's not always easy. But let's have a prayer right now, shall we? To invite the Holy Spirit to not only convict us of following God, but empower us to follow God in His strength. Let us pray. God, thank you for this cautionary tale of a man you created and loved, that you desired to turn away from his anger, his jealousy, from the sin that was crouching at his door. Thank you, God, for this, this tale where you have said that he could master it, not in his own strength, but what you would provide for him as you provided everything for his parents and for all of humanity. Lord, I just pray for my friends listening in right now that you'll bless them with a desire to follow you, with the power of the Holy Spirit to actually follow through with our word, and that for all of us, Lord, we will experience your cheerfulness and joy 
that you on the cross, Jesus, died in our place and took our sins upon you and gave us your righteous robes, your righteousness in our, in, in our place of our sins. So bless us now as we celebrate you, Lord, your life, your death, your rest, and your resurrection. In Jesus' name we say, amen. I pray you and your family will be blessed this weekend, this coming week, in the knowledge that God loves you. So may God's peace, presence, and power be in your life today. Have a blessed Sabbath.